So I would like to, uh, to welcome, all, welcome you all to this uh, panel, and with uh, no further interference from me, let's... Norm, you're going first? Okay, great. I, I, I'm Norm Jones. I'm the first half of a, a two-person report on what Utah State is doing. But having heard the panels this morning, I think I, I have to say that I am the enemy. Uh, I am the Director of General Education and Curricular Immigration at Utah State. I also chair the Utah Systems Task Force on General Education that oversees all the rules. So I am, in some sense, the enemy, but I'm also a historian of 18 years of employment in. So uh, I've been tuning since we started tuning. And what I want to very briefly walk you through is what tuning has done to Gen Ed and how that's coming back to history as a set of interesting questions. Um, we started tuning in 2009, so we were part of the, the, the first experiment that we did. Uh, and thanks to Dan McInerney's brilliance, I should say. Is that okay, Dan? Can I call you brilliant? <laughs> He's humble. <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> Uh, I went away on sabbatical and left Dan to deal with the great fiscal crisis and, and the introduction of tuning. And it that, you, yeah, that you can quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, so the, the department developed its outcomes and it developed its rubrics and we began to uh, engineer backwards from the capstone, the outcomes of the history degree backwards. The more we engineered backwards, the more it raised interesting questions about what else happens in the curriculum. We do not exist in a vacuum as a department. Uh, are we using what other things are in the curriculum to our advantage was really the question that the department was forced to ask. But I, as the director of Gen Ed, had to ask the question the other way around. What is it that a Gen Ed course offers the major? And so what I want to very briefly do is talk about what, what happened then. Because tuning worked so well at Utah State that at first our college took it over. And uh, now the university is doing it. And we work within, we are a LEAP state, they see you, so we have the essential learning outcomes. Uh, we are also uh, working on the degree qualification profile quite enthusiastically, which has now been blended with tuning and is turning into an alphabet soup that nobody can remember what any of it means. What I, at, the, at the core, it does mean one thing, it means that the faculty take responsibility for it, saying, what is it that we are teaching? What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? Uh, and where, how do those, those pieces of the curriculum all come together? So you've got a handout. I think Julia's, we got them all out there. They're, okay, they're, they say USU 1300, 13, USU 1320, and USU 1340. So our gen ed system looks very much like all the other gen ed systems that you've ever seen. Uh, students have to take courses in the social sciences, the humanities, and in our particular instance, we have an American institutions requirement, one of those wonderful relics of the Cold War. In about 1954, they decided that all students in the state of Utah had to be turned into good Americans by taking a course in either history, government, or econ. You can be a capitalist or you can know about history and government. Those are your choices. Uh, so those are, those are gen ed courses and we have integrated courses. That is, we have an integrated course in humanities or social sciences that says this is a course in which you learn about what the humanities or the social sciences actually do. How do they construct knowledge? So what I did is I brought the faculty teaching these things together and said, you have to tell me what your outcomes are. What must happen in a course that is going to be called a social science or humanities or an American institutions course. What must happen? We don't care what department teaches it, what must happen? And then we ask another question, and this is where the, the fun starts. What does competence look like in that gen ed course? If I'm going to say to the, to the, the major, if your students take this course, we guarantee you that they can dot, dot, dot. What is it that this course is doing? Uh, these integrated courses allow you to, to construct courses thematically. We've got some great ones. Uh, comparative Renaissance is one of my favorites. They, the content is there. You can do it with a traditional Western sieve, or you can do it with a world sieve, or Dan does it with, I think, a fairly traditional sort of American sieve up to the Civil War, something like that. 
It doesn't, it doesn't remove the normal course, but what it does is it gives you all sorts of interesting room to explore how your discipline fits in the larger conversation. So if you've got those in front of you, uh, <coughs> sorry, just very quickly, and, and this, is, this gets to the question some of us have been wrestling with, is the discipline of history humanities or is it social sciences? If, if you look at the USU 1300, now that's a rubric for American institutions. This is where our citizenship, civic education stuff comes in. Uh, you can ask Dan about that because he's the chair of that particular committee. <laughs> but you notice that there are, there are areas of key knowledge and then there are all these other, the, the clarity of communication, the scholarly analysis kinds of questions. The humanities discussion, and history is a humanities course at USU, humanities discussion is very interesting because they settle on the fact that we deal with big questions. And we deal with big questions through primary sources. And that those primary sources are discussed in secondary sources, and you have to be able to use both together. This was great news for me. It was terrible news for the philosophers who don't actually believe in secondary sources. <laughs> that was a revelation. And Mary Ann says, we don't know what our colleagues do and how they think. Well, that, <laughs> philosophers don't have secondary sources. They don't see themselves as, as their conversations being secondary. <laughs> when, when we asked the social science people to define what the social sciences were uh, in a workable fashion, what we got was a very interesting discussion. Uh, and that when, one where history may be uh, in there, but sometimes it's not in there. Because if you look at that, you notice that it keeps talking about the placing things into historical periods, historical context. But of course, the sociologists, the psychologists are much more interested in social structures and systems than they are in people. Uh, and so where, where history goes under this kind, and in my my institution, uh, the, the system in Utah is half and half. Half an institution say history is a social science, half say it's a humanities in our system. Uh, we haven't got any clarification on that, but this, these documents are beginning to help that conversation because you have to know what will be in the gen ed course and how it is assessed. And notice we, this is not a rubric for grading, this is a rubric for judging a syllabus. But there is always that right-hand column there, and that's the one where the fun comes in. Faculty are, the social scientists, they called it inefficacy. <laughs> okay, inadequate mastery in American institutions, but my favorite is the humanists who, maybe because of their linguistic backgrounds, actually were willing to say that we know incompetence when we see it. <laughs> And I have colleagues who are now in their classes with their rubrics actually using these things and telling their students they are incompetent. Uh, um, it does have an effect. One of our, our, our colleagues said the next time I'm going to say, you're not incompetent, we know it was a good effort, you tried hard, you'll do better next time. Yeah. You see, you, you see what we have done. We've asked the faculty to actually tell us what has to happen in this course, and how that allows us to feed it into the major. Because now the major has some idea of where they're starting, and it has some idea of what it is that we're teaching them. I mean, in Utah State, I, I've got 25,000 students a semester taking Gen Ed, and about 1,500 of those are in history courses. So it's very important for the history department to know what it is it's supposed to deliver for all those people who will never take another history course, will never take another course in humanities. So tuning for us has created this kind of monster because it keeps getting larger as more and more faculty groups get involved in this conversation of what it is that we do, and why do we do it, and who is our next consumer. So my, my last suggestion is always remember, your next consumer, your major needs a job. But most of the time, the next consumer of your student is the next course they take. You know, can they think critically or analytically? Well, we all know that the 3,000 level, we're getting a lot of students can't do that yet, so who are we going to blame for that? Well, that's probably because we taught those courses. So anyway, I'm not going to turn it over to Dan to get into the degree of the department. Thanks, Norm. And um, what I want to talk about is just one illustration of what can be done 
with some of the themes that we've been talking about since 9 this morning. Questions about pathways. Questions about intentional curriculum. Uh, questions, too, uh, about the assumptions that students make when they come to these academic choices and the assumptions that faculty make about this and the need to deal with both points of view. One, one consideration, one illustration of a way that our department has tried to bring these different themes together is by creating a pre-major in history modeled on what many other disciplines on our campus do for their students in their very carefully structured sequenced and intentional curriculum. The pre-major itself is pretty basic in its outline. What we want is students who declare a major after they've done some preliminary work in a variety of fields. And we have three areas in particular that we're interested in students uh, making these accomplishments. And, and I'll, I'll tell you right from the start, this is an approach that's quite different from the one that Ken outlined where they were doing away with prerequisites, in a sense, we're bringing them back. And oddly, for the same purposes. Um, we ask for students to establish a foundation in three different areas. Not to add to the demands of their degree, but to help them make better choices in the requirements they have laid out for them by the university. First of all, we're asking them to complete a series of foundational surveys in a variety of fields, Western world and U.S. Secondly, we ask them to make more precise choices about that huge list of gen ed courses they have in front of them. What the department has done is to offer our students about a dozen gen ed courses that help them satisfy that university requirement. But courses that we think are going to help students lay a good foundation for their later historical studies. And thirdly, we ask students to complete as freshmen or as sophomore the university's competency courses in writing and math that are required for us, all students. Again, not adding to the 120 goal at the end of a degree, but trying to help students make better choices among those credits, all of which is designed to help students do as well as possible in an upper division course. And the reasoning behind this really struck me last semester as a course began. Uh, this is last year, a course on the Civil War. It's an upper division class. And the question that came up on the first day of class in a classroom like this on our campus came from a student who walked up to me at the end of class and said, uh, I need a class. And uh, she liked the topic. Okay, she liked the topic. That's, that's our great strength, even non-majors like what we teach. Uh, she's never had a history course, she told me. But this is a good time for a schedule. <laughs> and, and I don't mean to mock any of these arguments. I understand the importance of all of them for the, for the student. It's the perspective she brings to this. But at the other end of the podium is the instructor in a tuning faculty who is arguing, remember, this is history 3750. And you've never taken any history surveys. This is the answer I give to most students now. Would you sign up for Chem 3750 if you'd never taken a 1,000 or 2,000 level Chem course? It usually stops students and makes them think a little more clearly about the choice they're making. What's going on in the student's mind? First of all, and again, I'm so grateful to her, her interest in the topic. She wants to know about the Civil War. Secondly, I understand the importance of the schedule for her because like most of my students, she's working and she needs to find something that's going to work into her work schedule as well as her academic schedule. And she's also got in mind a series of numbers in her head about credit load that she's supposed to be carrying, the registration requirements of the university. Quite possibly, she has thoughts too about her financial aid conditions, how many courses she has to take in order to qualify. And she's also doing some measuring about her own grade point average. Her world is filled with numbers, and our world is filled with other kinds of concepts. But we at least need to acknowledge and understand why that student would come up to us with what seems at, at the base, it's just kind of an outrageous request. Let me get into an advanced course before taking any foundational work. 
What's going on on the tuning faculty's mind is something else, of course, three basic considerations. First of all, what's been guiding us since the project began in the AHA? Our understanding of learning itself that what we're, what we're curious about is not just the interest that a student has in a particular subject matter, but adequate preparation for the skills that we are going to examine and elevate in an upper division course. These knowledge and skills that students bring to a course, not just their passion for the course, all of those are important, but I think it's, it's that skill set that my student who talked to me after class didn't quite grasp. Um, and what I needed to explain to her is that the goal of, a, of, a, of an upper division course is to ratchet up or scale up, not just a body of knowledge, but a set of skills. That we're building both expertise and competency in upper division courses. We're not just adding credits to a scorecard. A second consideration that most of us bring to these kinds of questions, and that informed our choice for a pre-major, was the reflection that many have talked about this morning, the relation of history to a broader curriculum. Uh, instead of thinking of our classes in individual terms, my class, my subject, my group, trying to think of a class in relation to the larger curriculum of a department, and then thinking of that history curriculum in relation to other post-secondary requirements. And again, Norm and I are at a four-year institution, a land-grant college with over 25,000 students. What we're looking at is not only bodies of knowledge, which is what my student was interested in. She simply wanted to know more about the Civil War. What I had to more clearly convey to her is that I have two interests at stake in the upper division course. Also those skills that I can impart to her and what we might call cross-cutting skills that she could bring from other foundational courses. To get her to try to see how these parts might come together and how that might help her succeed much better in an upper division course. The third and final consideration is one that I think many of us have been facing since the AHA project began. We're looking at, as Norm said, at such an alphabet soup of academic reforms on our campuses. It is overwhelming, and we can't be pulled in six different directions. How can we bring these academic initiatives in learning together? This is looking beyond our department, our curriculum, looking beyond our gen ed program at one institution and trying to integrate these different models for learning in the 21st century. Here's one way of envisioning it. Uh, we're all involved in the tuning project uh, with a grant from the Lumina Foundation. And the, the goal there is to explore critically the learning that we think goes into a major. Some of us, not all of us, are engaged in a second Lumina project, this DQP what Marianne referred to as the degree qualifications profile. The goal there is to think about the learning that not only goes into a major, but the learning that goes into a degree. A third set of initiatives that our campus and many of your campuses are connected to has been referred to already, the essential learning outcomes from the AACMU. This is looking at key areas of skill and knowledge that all American post-secondary students should be exposed to, regardless of their major. A fourth area, a fourth commitment we've signed up for in our state and our campus is the AACMU's LEAP program, Liberal Education and America's Promise. This is trying to align our outcomes, our practice, and our policies. We're also signed up and I've had experience too in this value program. The VA stands for valid assessment, the valid or authentic assessment of the learning that students do within our classes, um, demonstrating achievement in ways that other colleagues and stakeholders can understand. And we're also signed up in our state with a quality collaboratives program that links two-year and four-year institutions to try to facilitate transfer and mobility uh, within the state of Utah itself. Our hope is that the pre-major 
helps to serve all of these programs at once, bringing together all of these goals into one structural change within a department. Is it firm and, and, and inflexible? No. We allow room for flexibility, for faculty to make decisions on which students really should be pushed into an upper division course, given a taste of that. We encourage our advisor, too, to speak to students in that way. What we're looking for beyond anything is helping students succeed in our courses, especially at the upper division. We don't want them to fail. It's become too time consuming and frankly, too expensive for them to fail. We want them to understand the consequences of making better choices in getting into these classes. And finally, thinking about Gen Ed, the way colleagues in Asia are starting to think about it. As colleagues in the Hong Kong system, who also have introduced a GE system, but colleagues for whom GE doesn't stand for general education, it stands as gateway education. Okay, thanks very much. a couple things that I think actually connect to what Dan spoke about, um, only I'm going to be looking at them from the viewpoint of a, a two-year college, a community college. Um, but one of the things that we've tried to do is not only to have history be part of the Jedi curriculum, but also to create something that I think aligns with his idea of a pre-major, which is a major at the community college for history. So I'll take a look here. Um, and you can see I've borrowed a bit from probably your rival school, I'm not sure. Um, but two questions always sort of try to um, guide everything that I do when I, when I look at how we structure our history program and uh, how I approach courses. And that's first, how do we share with our colleagues, our students, and the public what is distinctive about history? Um, what it can offer that sometimes other social sciences or humanities courses can't. Um, and then also, how do we encourage our students and the rest of our college to see history, not just the humanities, not just social sciences, but history in particular, as something that's very vital to the education of the student, and not just one of a variety of gen ed requirements, but something that really is in itself essential to um, their overall education. So just a little background, um, at Bergen Community College we've got about 17,000 students, um, three campuses, and we prioritize transfer degrees. So we are looking specifically to move students into four-year colleges after they're, they're finished with us. Um, and so one of the most popular degrees is in liberal arts, and it's called LA, AALA Gen. So it's a general liberal arts uh, education degree. And part of that is uh, a six credit requirement in history. It's not just a humanities course or a social sciences course. It is in itself a six credits required course. So this is actually what the program for a general liberal arts major looks like at uh, Burton Community College. And you can see you've got a history elective here at the beginning in their first semester and then another one here. Um, they have a choice of a variety of different electives, but they are required to take two history courses before they can leave um, the general liberal arts program. Um, and I'll point something else out to you real quickly. That's the diversity elective, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a second, but that's also required for every um, degree-seeking student at Bergen Community College. Um, so one of the things that this is telling students and telling our colleagues is that we consider it to be essential for students to have a background in history, not just one course, but two, before they transfer to a four-year college. So we hope that we're doing you a service in that way. Um, we also have that diversity requirement, and that is something, like I said, every college student at Bergen has to take this diversity course. And I'll show you the list here very quickly. You'll see history courses actually um, dominate the list of diversity courses as well. So you are getting two required history courses, and you're also getting a diversity course that includes geography or one of those variety of history courses. Um, and we have uh, Latin American history, women's history, African American history, um, and a new course that I'm going to be teaching on uh, genocide and Holocaust. So all of these are being um, uh, provided as 
an additional history course that you can take as part of the program outside of um, history. So both of these requirements, both to have a history course as part of Gen Ed um, and also to um, uh, have a diversity course are going to sort of raise visibility on our campus for history and it allows every liberal arts major who goes through the college to come through our doors, um, which is also going to allow us to promote history in a, in a, a way that I consider to be beyond Gen Ed. Um, and I'm looking at this in, in two different ways. Um, I, I did want to mention something I forgot to do is um, I had not realized until I, I started listening to some of my colleagues speak today, but we have 10 um, learning goals for the college, and I don't know that they align with everyone else's. I assume that they would, but one of our 10 learning goals for the entire college is uh, historical perspective. And so we have to have, um, in all courses, people need to be addressing this historical perspective. So that's been very helpful for us in promoting the idea that history is in and of itself uh, something of value for all of our students, no matter what their major might be. All right, but the first idea of going beyond Gen Ed with history is that we actually have um, a history option, which we commonly refer to as a history major. We're trying to brand it, I guess, a little bit. But um, it's our version of history major. We have about 115 to 120 students enrolled in this major each year. Um, and I'm hoping, I, the more I hear about it, uh, that it's similar to the pre-major to four-year college, because this is, of course, what the transfer community colleges are seeking to do, which is to prepare students to enter into these four-year colleges ready to hit the road running as a junior. Um, and I think the more we look at that and the more, and I, I sincerely appreciate the tuning committee um, and, and project for incorporating community college faculty, because it allows us to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, where we try to see if our expectations and, and our requirements are meeting up with what you might at a four-year college expect for your freshmen and sophomores. Um, I think it will ease a lot of the transition trouble uh, that students have to see it in that way. Um, so hopefully it is, it is similar to the pre-major at a four-year college. Um, and our goal is certainly to serve as this sort of um, possibility for college transfers who wish to be history majors when they get to a four-year college. So we look at providing, and I know there's been some discussion on this, uh, at least among our little group, of uh, what historical literacy actually means, um, but we're looking to provide it in both ways, in terms of the basic historical content and also an introduction to some more advanced history skills. Um, so we can discuss that more as a group later. But this is what the history major looks like at Bergen Community College, and hopefully there's a handout going around at some point too. But you have um, both, I'll show it to you this way as well, um, two semester survey sequence courses. So you need to take um, a sequence in US history, um, Western Civ, Latin American, or women's. You also have to take one world geography course and then you have an option of three history electives, they all have to be from the history department, and then two free electives that if you are sincerely interested in history can also be history courses. So out of the 63 credits that you need in order to graduate, 24 of those can be history. Now the debate within our department, and one that I'd love to continue here if, if there's any interest, is whether it is better for a two-year college to provide only the basic skills um, within its major. So should we only be teaching introductory level survey courses and then uh, push them into more advanced courses when they get to the four-year level? Or should our program be tiered just like it is in the four-year schools so that more challenging material is presented in the second semester, the third semester, and the fourth semester? Um, or should we really be leaving that um, tiered skill level to the four-year college? And so my question uh, for, for all of you is whether that, um, the idea, which of these ideas more closely resembles what you see in a four-year college for your freshmen and sophomores? And then perhaps a slightly different question, which experience is preferable? Is it better in a freshman and sophomore level to only get introductory courses, only get survey courses, um, not be exposed to things like historiography and uh, specific methodology? or whether that experience might be valuable in the freshman and sophomore year as you're moving into the junior and senior year at a four-year school. 
All right, so the second part of uh, going beyond gen ed is the idea of pairing courses. And this is a new initiative at our college to pair history courses um, with other humanities, social sciences, or even beyond. We haven't tried pairing it with a science class yet, but in, in theory that's possible as well. I'm interested in the second half of this workshop to see how we could maybe uh, approach that. Um, the idea, the one that was tried last year was pairing a Latin American history course with a Latin American cinema course. Um, and then in the fall, I'm gonna be pairing a genocide and Holocaust course with an English composition course that is themed to um, issues of genocide and, um, and Holocaust. So the idea, oh, and one more, um, there's encouragement from our college because we are a community college and because we've already talked about some of these issues that we face in terms of students who need some additional help with um, writing skills, language skills, etc. They're pushing us to pair our history courses with English basic skills and American language courses, which um, I can see some value in and I also uh, am slightly resistant to because we do want our courses to be reading and writing intensive and, and that can provide um, some incredible uh, struggle uh, for some of these uh, entering students. All right, so uh, the question of why to pair courses, and again, I approach this from the, the tuning perspective, hopefully, is that it's allowing us to show the value of history for contextualizing and comprehending all of these other humanities and social sciences um, at a deeper level and providing substance in particular for their composition. So it's allowing them to use history to think about other aspects of their education. Um, and so in this case, you're, you're using history and showing how history can be valuable outside the history classroom, making it part of a more organic experience, not an isolated requirement that they don't see having any sort of value for them outside their one particular history course that they have to take. Um, so it's also providing, I think, or I hope, um, uh, an opportunity for both students and the colleagues that we work with in these paired courses to see this distinctive perspective that we offer as historians. So what kind of questions do we ask about the same material um, that might be different from the way a literature professor approaches or a composition professor approaches the topic? So the overarching goal, I'm, I'm going back to Kenneth Pomerantz's uh, reflections on the goals for Lumina um, and hopefully not destroying his intent um, <laughs> this particular quote. Um, but he's, he said that he's hoping that general education can become a reservoir of skills and perspectives that are in dialogue with those stressed by a particular major rather than a separate standalone dimension. So the idea I think here with the paired courses is to show how you can move this kind of um, uh, historical perspective outside of the history classroom and make it part of this organic uh, general education that students seek and need to move into uh, the rest of the world. So in general, here it is. Uh, we hope to communicate the utility of historical study even for students who choose to go outside of history, who seek a profession or a major that is not history, um, while also recognizing and appreciating the unique perspective that history can offer. And then of course, perhaps we'll get a new major or two along the way. Hi, I realize I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> My apologies. Um, yeah, I'm at Regis University in Denver, Colorado, which is a uh, Jesuit university. Uh, the traditional undergraduate college has about 1,600 students. And our, um, our draw is that we're the only Jesuit institution between the Mississippi and the West Coast. <laughs> but we, we vertically challenged. <laughs> um, but uh, we also have a, um, have always had a, a, a large uh, nursing program and we've recently increased it to, we've added a PhD in physical therapy and a PhD in uh, pharmacy, as well as an MA in biology of medical sciences for people who after majoring in history or philosophy decide they'd better go to medical school so they can have a career. But we have a, a very diverse group of undergraduates. Um, we have, uh, because it's a Jesuit school, that we, we, that's, we get a, a significant number of, of students from Texas, Chicago, LA. Um, I think those are three of our big areas. Um, 
And, but we also have a commitment program, which is for students who have minimal capabilities, have, may have some limitations or some kinds of learning disability, and for them we provide all sorts of extra services. And um, the, the courses that I teach always have a mix of students who are some of the, the best and the brightest. They could, have, they could be at any university in the United States, but then I also have a third of our students are with some kinds of disability. So we have a huge mix, and then we have a lot of uh, students from very rich families who really don't want to go to college, but their parents think it would be advisable. <laughs> and those are the really problematic ones. But in any case, um, our, <laughs> we have um, our big question for the conference today and for the American Historical Organization and for tuning is, or for tuning history, is how do we make history relevant to the core? Um, and from my perspective, history is critical thinking and um, history for me is asking questions and it's not asking questions that somebody who wrote the book thought were interesting, but it's questions that I think are interesting and, or it's questions that my students think are interesting. That's what I, I like to focus on. And so since it's asking questions, I see it as problem solving. So I really don't think there's a dichotomy between critical thinking and problem solving because to solve a problem, you have to think critically. Um, so maybe we don't have such a communication problem. So I, I, what I do in my courses is um, I, have, I begin with everything with a question. What quest questions are we asking? Um, then we search sources for evidence. Um, then we weigh sources against each other. Um, we determine the intentions of the authors of those sources, and then we come to, how is this all relevant to students? Um, well, this goes to life. Um, they're going to read consumer reports to buy a, a new um, a Android or an iPhone. They need to know which one is better and why they need to do some background on the history of those different phones, the different uh, uh, plans that they have. They need to... Uh, vote for politicians, they, hopefully they'll do some critical thinking when they vote for politicians, <laughs> listen to their ads on TV and successive ads saying the opposite thing. You think they have to stop to think. Um, they have to buy a car, they have to find, take out loans. They, they need to think critically. So from my perspective, um, not just history, everything is about critical thinking. Life is critical thinking. And with progress portfolios, I take the, these, these groups of students, and my classes are about, the, the entry-level classes are about 30 students, give or take a few. Um, students have to take responsibility for their own learning in order to demonstrate progress. And the whole point of progress portfolios is students have to demonstrate their abilities in specific um, learning outcomes. So what I'm, what I'm going to present is based on the work of others. Uh, Dr. Ken Sagendorf, who's the director for the Center in Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Regis University, he came to us from the Air Force Academy. And I always point out to my students, if it's good enough for the Air Force Academy, it's good enough for you. <laughs> and, um, and the other thing that I'm going to draw on is Dr. Lendl Calder of Augustana College, who many of you probably know and have read his Uncoverage model. So what I'm doing, all, I, all that I've done is adapt their paradigms to my content, which is Middle Eastern history and environmental history. <clears throat> so in um, the tuning workshops that we've done, the focus has been, was the first one we went to in Arlington, Virginia, was on student learning outcomes. And the student learning outcomes drive progress portfolios. That's the heart of them. So uh, from after, uh, with the um, learning outcomes being the bedrock of the portfolios, all learning experiences, that is assessment, feedback, um, and improvement are based on those learning outcomes. Everything goes back always to those learning outcomes. And it, with progress portfolios, I do direct assessment class by class of each student's um, assignments um, and I give them back feedback the next class, next time that we meet, just little notes on their pages 
And if they're going to demonstrate progress, they have to respond to my notes, and they can do that in the margin. They can put a, a sticky note, a yellow sticky note on there, and write why did you, why they did this, or how they figured out how to do it differently. Now I'll talk more about that. So students get immediate feedback, immediate reinforcement, immediate direction, um, and by students responding from class to class to each assignment on their portfolios, students demonstrate, they have to demonstrate in writing and in orally, because I do midterm interviews, they have to explain their learning, they have to explain how they were able to do something that they couldn't do before. Um, and that is, to me, uh, they're developing critical thinking skills. So they think about how they did what they did and how they learned what they learned. Um, so this is uh, for my learning-focused um, graph. Evidence of improvement um, ups the student grades in, in three ways. The points for class assignments can increase when they respond to my questions. Um, and they do come in for a midterm interview. And uh, last time I had three classes with 30 students in each, that was 90 interviews. So I cut them from 15 minutes to 10. Um, <laughs> I mean, I had days, just lines in the hallway, <laughs> students coming in for interviews. But they have to come in and they have to explain. They have to go, they have to bring a portfolio. They have to put it together, and I'll talk some more about that. They have to bring it in and explain to me how they progressed from the first assignment to the second to the third, each assignment. They have to be able to explain that to me. They have to demonstrate progress, and that becomes a large part of their grade. Um, these are my learning outcomes. Um, they have to demonstrate orally and in writing the ability to do these things. Um, these um, I adapted from Lendl Calder's Uncoverage model. I, I put some together and shrunk and modified them and I figured I couldn't, couldn't have a whole list of things. I had to have a, a, a number that was all complementary. So the, I focus, everything the students do is focused on these five learning outcomes. And, they have, and their grade is dependent on not just that they do the work, but that they improve from beginning to end. So they keep getting C's. They're going to lose a lot of credit by the end because their final portfolio is a quarter of their grade. And, if they have, and I'll show you the assessment tables and they can figure out very easily how they're doing. Um, this mean, leads me to my, um, oops. I, my learning experiences, I said, and this follows exactly about, um, Lendl Calder's Uncoverage model. And for those of you who are not familiar with this Uncoverage model, it's a pun on arguments in history departments, yes, but we have to cover blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's like, and, and in covering all of that material in a, in a textbook, what uh, the textbook writers do is they cover up what it is that historians did to arrive at that story they're telling you. And so Uncoverage is about, you no, know, instead of telling students the story that you would like them to memorize or they can give back to you on the exam, you no, know, instead of doing that, you uncover how do, how do authors come up with what they think they know? How do they come up with this? So, uh, in my Middle East courses, it's like, how do I get their attention? Well, that would be oil. So I give them um, Robert Newman's History of Oil. And you can Google that, and it'll come right up, and you can watch it online. It is hilarious. He's an eco-environmentalist uh, comedian who did this stand-up show. It was in 2007 in London. And um, he's British, so he has a bit of an accent, which is, for some of my students, a little bit difficult. <laughs> But um, he's, he's a comedian, and the whole show is powered by bicycle. There's somebody in the background, and they, the, the lights keep going because he's powering a bike, bicycle because he's eco-conscious. But um, and it's a uh, it's a very different perspective on the history of oil and on the history of the world. So I begin. The first thing I do is I it's a it's like 45 minutes long, and I just ask them to watch. It's divided into chapters them to watch the first four chapters. Each chapter is five minutes long, so it's painless, or fairly painless. And I ask them, what historical question do you think Newman is asking that the first four chapters can answer? 
very simple. What, what's this guy up to? Because his, his, his presentation and his point of view was so foreign to anything they will have been exposed to or have thought in their lives that they'll, they'll be astounded. So um, I give them this set of questions. What's his thesis? thesis. And they, they don't know what thesis means, so what's his point of view um, in this chapter? What evidence does he present to, to support his point of view? Because he gives you a very pronounced thesis, and he gives you very specific evidence. And then he gives you the opposite point of view. And then he uses humor to make the other point of view look ridiculous. And they have, they're so unused to the idea of humor in a classroom <laughs> that they, they, they have a hard time coming up with this. <laughs> I mean, they're just astounded that this would be part of history, something funny. Um, so contextualizing and evaluating, these are my, my learning outcomes. Contextualizing and evaluating sources. Answer these four questions for each of the, the four chapters are marching to the drums and it's about some obscure British regiment, which was the second regiment to go to war, and so um, it marching to the drums, and it's like, who cares about this regiment? And he, he makes fun of it, kind of. Uh, my, my son wore fatigues from two years old to 12 years old, so he makes fun of those kinds of people who are inordinately interested in the history of obscure military regiments. Um, and then he, he um, he, so he talks about, he takes us to the Middle East, and he's talking about bringing a better democracy, and he's, he shows, shows the overthrow of, uh, overthrow of, of uh, Mossadegh in 1952, and he says, well, wait a minute, they had a democracy, but no, they needed a better democracy, and then he always has a little clip of him dressed as a Vietnamese soldier with a Vietnamese person listening to an old-fashioned shortwave radio, listening to... The United States and Britain have today decided to bring a better democracy to the Middle East. <laughs> so eventually the students get the idea that there is another point of view being put forward. So it, it's, uh, and people from Texas will love chapter four about thou, sh thou shalt steal oil. So um, this is, uh, I get them some kind of relevance. They can relate to oil in the Middle East. They can relate to the United States being at war in the Middle East. And um, what is it, Strategic Air Command, I believe they do have, a, their center is in Colorado, and I have a lot of um, veterans, I have veterans from the different, uh, from the different wars, from uh, Iraq and from Afghanistan in classes, and I have uh, the wives and daughters and, and girlfriends of uh, military, so we, they're interested. Um, now, then I get the historical thinking, because my first learning outcome is asking his meaningful historical questions. If a student can ask a meaningful historical question, I tell them all the time that's better than being able to answer it. <laughs> because if you, can, if you can formulate a good question, you can answer it. You have to have, but it's the good question that'll get you the motivation to go out there and answer it. So, what, and then I, I want them, what is Newman's historical question? It's all that the whole assignment is, that they do at home. I give them background before they watch the chapters. I give them some introduction, some background. Learn, and the next learning experience that I give them is primary sources. Okay, so now they've, had a, they've watched a documentary or a docudrama, because it's hard to find a, uh, always, because I teach the Middle East from about 600 to the present in two semesters, so I, but I do, I, I find some documentaries. But in any case, for primary sources, imperialism in the 1890s, which is dealing with the same thing that the documentary they've just seen is dealing with, I give them beverages, March of the Flag, and I know that the American Historical Association has the beverage award and that his grand, I believe it's his grandson. <laughs> and I, I believe that his grand, I think it's his grandson is the, uh, a, the corporate lawyer for the um, American Historical Association. But I give him this excerpt from the March of the Flag, and if you've never read this, you've got a real treat in store for you. So I give him a, a little bit of it, not the whole thing. And then Blunt, uh, who's an Irish uh, 
criti a journalist critic of the British Empire in, in Egypt. I give him a bit from Britain's Imperial Destiny and then uh, Kipling's The White Man's Burden. And I was astounded when they read the Kipling's White Man's Burden as the opposite of what it was, <laughs> like it was a critique of imperialism. <laughs> And I thought, oh my goodness, I really have to do some more work with these students before I give them sources. So I give them uh, the learning experiences. Where I'm asking them to do very sophisticated things. You think, what? No, they're interested. They, they, they can get into two pages on Britain's imperial destiny because it's just so astounding, the things that people wrote and that they said. And uh, yeah, Beveridge, didn't he run for um, senator of uh, Indiana? Yeah, yes. he ran for senator of Indiana. He sounded just like, oh, I'm sorry, um, asking historical questions. Students are, don't come out of K-12 education thinking about asking good questions. They're thinking, what do I have to do to get a good grade? So I, this is all right from Lyndall Calder's Uncoverage model. So I give them a, a, an example. Um, What's a bad question of these? They have to ask their, their primary sources a, a bad question. They have to tell me why it's a bad question. And they learn a great deal doing that. And when they don't give me a bad question, I, I point things out. I, I explain to them why it's not a bad question or why it is a good question. A good question, but difficult to answer. I explain that, yes, that's a good question, but with the little limited sources you have, you can't possibly answer that question. And finally, a good question. Why, why is it a good question? So I try to get them to focus in on your question and the sources. Do they match? Oh, okay. Um, contextualizing and evaluating secondary and primary sources. Ah, now I make them go through and answer their question. They have to find a piece, one, just one piece of evidence of each of these three short things to support their argument. Inferring from available evidence. Oh, now I'm asking them to draw conclusions based on evidence acknowledging that they're tentative conclusions because you don't know about everything. But for, on the basis of what you have before you, you can do this. And I have students who come to me with learning disabilities who can do this. Okay? And I have students who are the best students in the world who love it. It's those ones who don't want to be there, who want to <laughs> drag their feet. And if you have any clues on how to get to them, I'd, I'd be happy to take that information. But you see how the very simple exercise, they can progress to a very uh, competent level. Then the third learning experience is to give them narrative source, uh, a secondary source. So I give them a, an excerpt from the introduction to a book that I'm writing on Middle Eastern history. It's a reframing history where I talk, about, I talk about the same issues that they've seen a documentary on and that they've read primary sources. And then William R. Polk, who is, I believe, the grandson of President Polk, who established the Middle East Center at the University of Chicago. Um, his book on understanding Iraq talks about the same thing. And then I, what, what's the thesis of each of these? And how do they relate to this documentary? Oh, now they are synthesizing, analyzing, drawing conclusions. And the amazing thing is that they feel empowered to criticize me and, and William Polk, the president's grandson, because it's like, well, you know, so-and-so said they now have evidence and they can make their own argument. They can point out shortcomings in what someone else has done. Um, so in responses, in their responses to assessment, they, uh, it's class by class. They're always getting some feedback, however small. Um, and we come back to this learning-focused approach, approach where everything centers on those learning outcomes. They're constantly reinforced uh, and uh, re uh, reiterated. And finally, um, they have a midterm interview. They have to give me a midterm portfolio. Final portfolio is 25% of their grade. And I have one or two students who just don't turn them in. And you know that they're not the students who had a hundred, <laughs> who had an A going for you, but mostly do. And this is a list of, I give them this check sheet so they can grade their own work. 
and it's all based on their um, progress. Thank you very much. And I assume, Julia, this uh, rubric will be on the tuning side. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, what I, what's given to me uh, in advance is already up, but I will revise it with additional okay. material that has been presented today. So. Okay. Um, Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was thinking about your idea of portfolio and measuring the improvement, and I feel like that probably works very well with students of different abilities, like at your university. Um, and I'm wondering, is it possible in your courses for students oh, who produce work of vastly different qualities to get the same grades? And if so, then how does that speak to the other idea of competency in the course? And then just a bigger question is like, how do we ensure that students with disabilities emerge from college prepared to be competitive on the job market? Um, you know, I have some students who are competent from day one. Uh, and so what I do is I give them the option of doing the full exercise that Lendl Calder has in his uncoverage model, where you don't just do those first little baby steps. You actually write out for each assignment a full essay a full historical argument based on your question and your evidence. So I give them something else to do. And the students with learning disabilities, uh, uh, let's be, be frank here, instead of failing the course, they can pass with a C or maybe a B minus. All right. Um, it, um, I have students who you know, can hardly sit still in their seats. Um, so yeah, then they, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. So, but I appreciate your other concern. other questions. Question for Sarah: With the preparing the courses, I'm assuming this will be simultaneous in that succession. What we end up doing is um, listing them in our uh, our online registration as uh, paired. And so if you go to this particular composition course, it will say this course is paired with the history course. You need to simultaneously register for both these courses. And I'm curious if you've ever been able to, to have a shared text between the two courses. We haven't tried that yet, um, although I think that might be an interesting idea, just how both um, disciplines are approaching the same text. Um, right now, we're using uh, our own creation, I guess, sort of like a course pack rather than any solid textbook. Um, but I think that'd be an interesting way to, to again emphasize how these these different perspectives enter in the same topic. Can I interject that this kind of paired courses is identified as one of the high impact practices mm -hmm. by the AAC? You know, it's a learning community, community essentially. In the back. Uh, the idea is that I will be having them write um, uh, what we would consider more history-based papers, including a research paper, um, uh, approaching primary sources and, and analyzing them the way we would in a, in a history um, classroom. But we're also going to be using in the history classroom some of the literature pieces that they would use in composition. And then they will be asking their students to write not only, um, I'm not so solid with the literature component of this yet, but um, you know, analyses of the, of the literary pieces, but also to add a historical context component to those, um, to those pieces that they do for lit. And the other, as we move closer and closer to this, um, to this being a reality across a lot of history courses, I think what we'll see is that the um, English professors will start reading the um, history papers and the history professionals will start reading the composition papers and seeing what we can add um, from our various approaches to improve the learning that's coming out of both aspects of those those classes. I don't know if I've answered your question or not. Okay. I, think, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. okay, let's uh, adjourn to the coffee or like water momentarily. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, okay. We're going to clap. Okay. <laughs>